Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari here on Sunday afternoon. I think it's a Sunday afternoon, anybody. You're looking at a leopard, believe it or not. That is Hosanna, the male leopard. My name is James Henry. That is my Sunday smile. And you have got Senzo Mkese on camera there. Those are his three fingers. He only has three fingers, otherwise he'd show you the others. He does a remarkable job for a three-fingered man. Well done, Senzo. We are not alone out here. Ralph Kirsten is tracking lions on foot, if you can believe it. A brave thing to do on a Sunday afternoon. Opar is using the grinder in the workshop. You might be able to hear that. <laughs> Wonderful sounds for a Sunday afternoon in the wilderness. And then <laughs> we have Sydney heading out towards Tundi and her cub at some stage. Please talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Otherwise, you may use the chat stream on YouTube to ask us questions, send us your comments. You may insult us if you wish to. I can't promise that I'll acknowledge your insults, but you can certainly try and send us your amusing anecdotes. That would also be quite good. OK, uh, the reason you can hear the angle grind, if you can hear the angle grind, is that we're very close to camp, and that's because Hosanna has been hanging around very close to camp. Let's go a little bit closer to him. I'm going to try and spend some time with this special cat. Oops. Come on, Wendy. There we go. That's my girl. Oh. Yeah, Amy, yes, it is a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Wendy would disagree with you. That is the vehicle I'm driving. She has stalled. Luckily, we're on a hill. And as long as Hosanna moves sometime during the day, we'll be able to push her out. Just ease gently up towards the water. Hopefully get a better view. Hello, kitty. How are you? <laughs> it's very nice to see you. His head's up, which is, uh, well, somewhat unusual for the last little while. He spent a lot of time with his head down. And if you are perhaps a new viewer, this is Hosanna, the male leopard, aged two and a half. And he disappeared about three or four months ago. He went off. Uh, asserting his independence, having to do that, that's what male leopards do, and he's wandered back here to his sort of home town, if you like, for a little while. I don't think he's going to be here for very long, because generally they aren't. Yes, K6, it's fast becoming that way, isn't it? Hosanna spends an inordinate amount of time at this pan. I'd be very happy to call this Hosanna pan. You just keep your head up, boy. There were some Nyala here. I tried to get them and him in the same picture, but they saw him and made their barking noises and then wandered off. Decided they didn't want to be around him any longer. So I'm going to spend an extended period with Horsana today. See what he gets up to. He's had a very successful time at this pan. He's killed a Diker. He's killed an Impala somewhere around here as well stashed them both in the same tree, given us some magnificent pictures of him in his, in his tree, attracted his father. His father then, uh, well, either stole or asked him for and was granted a piece of his supper. And he looks very content indeed. Oh, yes. You just go back in there, hmm? Are you tired? Poor little fellow. Oh, shame. And dos, as they say in Afrikaans, which means sleep. <laughs> I can't promise you a great deal of action from Hosanna this afternoon. We might not be with him all afternoon, but we're going to spend quite a lot of time with him. With any luck, we'll have three cats, or three cat sightings here before the day is up. As I say, Ralph is trying to find some lions, and it'd be magnificent if we had them too. And we might go and help him out in the vehicle if he finds them on foot. And Sydney heading towards the magical, magical Tundi and her baby. Alrighty, let's head across to Ralphie, find out how far he's got towards the unknown pride from earlier. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard once again with the Bushwalk and the Sunset Safari. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten. On the camera, you've got Craig today. How's it, Craig? A.K.A. Batman. And hello once again to all of you. Now, please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat, because we'd love to know what you want to know about the African bush. Now, we're coming to you live from the Juma Traverse in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa, and I'm heading towards the Unkuhumas, where they, uh, those are the lion uh, pride that um, was spotted this morning, right up in our eastern corner. So we're going to be heading in that direction, because I went after the sunrise safari, and I tried to catch up with them again, but it seemed like they might have moved. So we're just going to go and check if we can't find their tracks and just find them a little bit again this afternoon with this kind of heat we're having it's rather warm uh, it's warmed up from the last few days so i think it's every uh, chance that these lions will be lying up in the shade as lions do a little bit more lethargic than leopards might be when it gets warm like this um, and with there being a nice big group of them it should be quite easy for us to find their tracks so that's exactly what we're going to be looking for and rexon our game scout, he's uh, scouting out as per usual and trying to get the little tracks. Now, Jill, uh, thanks for your question. I hear that the Birminghams, they've headed um, quite a lot further uh, south, down towards Londolosi or into the, the, the area a little bit further south uh, in the Sabi Sands. Um, so it doesn't seem like they're anywhere in the area. And it looks like the Avoca males have now every opportunity to really stake their claim as the territorial males of the area. And with the Unkohuma cubs, there were three little tiny little balls of fluff that um, uh, we received news of that have been uh, killed by hyenas. So as sad as that, might, that is, um, there's still now every chance that the Avoca males are going to relax with the Unkohuma pride and possibly mate with them and then have their own cubs. So uh, it actually might be better for the Unkohumas in the long run because they're not going to be having the stress like they have been having uh, when they killed that uh, buffalo and the Avokas coming in and chasing them off and really splitting them up. And then we had those two youngsters that were uh, literally roaming the property looking for their family uh, for a few days. So that might all calm down if the Avokas um, actually cover some of these females and get some cubs of their own so it's not such a bad thing um, in the long run as I say with those little cubs having uh, been killed so sometimes that's the way the wild works um, a little bit of a sacrifice for some can make things a little bit better now uh, we're gonna get hot on the trail and while we're doing that I'm gonna head you back to James with the leopard Well, look, he's changed uh, direction, so we too have changed direction here on what is a gorgeous winter's afternoon. I will tell you, unfortunately, that Wendy is having inordinate amounts of trouble. Her right front tire's gone flat. She's struggling to start, so I'm not sure how long we're going to be exactly where we are, but hopefully, uh, well, Sydney will get going soon. He's having some troubles as well. Back at camp, it all seems to happen at once. Hosanna enjoying very much being out on a Sunday afternoon. Lexi, we don't know where tingana has gone. Tristan heard him calling at about 10 o'clock last night, quite a long way south of where we are now. So he's probably just followed the Mramati drainage uh, river down towards the southern parts of Juma. He probably got tired halfway and went to sleep. For an extended period, he likes to do that. So he's probably not too far away, actually. You can see he's very tired now. Much smaller than his father still. His father's a heavy set fellow at the moment. He's been, uh, well, really doing well off the scraps of others. I'm going to ask you to swing the camera around, Senzo, because what we have there is a fairly rare event. You see there, down through that gap, there's the Nyala bull and a Nyala cow, 
It's not a rare event. It's a, an event we don't often see. It looked like they may have been about to um, get it on, as it were. Now, of course, they're on screen, and so they're a bit nervous and shy. But normally you don't see it, or you very seldom see it with the antelope, because it's a very, very quick event. Uh, mating is what I'm talking about here, in case some of you are confused. I doubt you will be. But that is what I'm on about. And, well, Hosan is pretty well hidden where he is. And if something does come down to have a drink on this warmish afternoon, you can rest assured that he is going to hide from them and then try and jump on them as they have a quiet Sunday drink, which is, a, I think, an unfortunate thing to experience on a Sunday afternoon. Jennifer, you say it looks exactly like Tingana. Well, if you say so. I personally do not... I cannot see the resemblance between leopards that are... Well, that's not true, actually. I, I'm not very good at discerning one leopard from the other. Um, but I perfectly accept that many people are, and I've certainly seen evidence of it. So if you say it looks like Tingana, I'm going to take your word for it. I am, however, going to ask you if you have ever... You've also described Tingana as beautiful, and I'm going to ask you if you have ever described a leopard as ugly, because I suspect you have not. I think they're all pretty magnificent. I made the mistake of calling a leopard pug-faced once, and um, I was soundly chastised uh, by various members of the Twitterverse. But they are, of course, all beautiful. Something has set a whole lot of birds to flight. Is there a raptor above us, perhaps? No, I don't see a raptor. No. No, it wasn't Hosanna. He didn't move at all. There is the Sunday sky. Not bad for winter, is it? I think it's about 27 degrees out here. Which is roughly 79 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an interesting one, Costa. Could Tingana be tolerating Hosanna because he provides food? Um, no, I don't think so. I think he's tolerating him simply because he's his son. And I don't know how to explain that better. You know, he's... it's... it's not like... He's not behaving in a completely unterritorial manner. I believe he was scent marking the other day, although whether he was scent marking actually for real or just uh, sort of relieving himself is unclear. So I'm not really sure. But I don't, you know, I don't think that makes a huge difference. I think if he started to sort of mate with some of the females in this area, which would have to be his, uh, well, his sisters, basically his sister and his, oh, gosh, it's difficult to figure it out. Um, Tandi is his sister, and therefore Guchava is his, uh, aunt, well, his his cousin. No, his niece. So it would have to be his niece or his sister, which um, is not ideal. Not impossible for it to work with the with the cats, but it's not ideal. Uh, you know, I think he started to, to try and mate, then maybe Tungana wouldn't be quite so tolerant of him. But at the moment, he is he is tolerant. And you can see he's just left him here. He's gone off marking his territory. He hasn't felt the need to hang around here and um, make sure that he keeps an eye on Hosanna. He's just left him. Ah, marvellous. Sydney has managed to fix his technical difficulties. He is out on drive. I'm now going to go and try and fix mine. A very, very good afternoon to you all. My name is Sydney, and welcome to the beginning of the game drive. I am not traveling alone this afternoon. I have got Fergus. He is my camera operator. 
Our plan for this afternoon is quite very much easy. Earlier on, there's been quite a lot of uh, different cat sightings, and I have decided this afternoon to go and see Tandi and Talamba. I will be going towards the central side of the game reserve, where I'm hoping to have a very good sighting. And for your questions and comments, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, and also on YouTube chat stream. Without any waste of time, I am now going to head towards the central area of the game reserve in order to see if we can find Tandi and Kalamba. <laughs> So, Tia, the lions and leopards, if you can check, the lions are very much more active early in the mornings and their tracks are way much bigger than the leopard tracks. Leopards during the day, yes, they are nocturnal, but you will see them doing some of the activities during the day with their tracks much smaller compared to the lion tracks. And the lions, they are, they are quite easy to track than the leopards. Leopards can be so very shy and they can easily come off ledge. So lions, it's easy to track them. Yes, they can come off ledge with the grasses, but they look much bigger and they normally walk in big prides. So I am very happy with this kind of weather this afternoon. As I can see that it's uh, very sunny and there's no too much cold. So the chances of animal activities are, re are very there. So I will be approaching the central part of the game reserve coming from the eastern side of the game reserve which is a little bit much more towards the Kruger National Park. Uh, Rosenda, I didn't copy your question very well. FC, if you can repeat that question for me. Uh, Rosenda, the herbivores, they don't really fight for the food because it's too much. Yes, herbivores are consisted of different group of animals which have got quite a lot of different preferences. Some of these herbivores are bulk grazers whereby when it comes to feeding, they are not selective. They just feed on both grass and leaves. Whereas some, they only eat leaves and some only eat grass. So these herbivores, they are herbivores, but they fall into different categories. So now I will be driving down. Let's see if uh, my colleagues on the other side are having something already. Well, we haven't found the Unkuhumas just yet, everybody, but we're still making ground, uh, obviously on foot. We don't move as fast as we are with the vehicles. But looking at this little track that we found while we're out, uh, that just giving you a nice scale of how big it is. And let's just have a check at exactly the length of it as well with my trusty uh, Leatherman there. So we're looking at, what is that? Uh, it's about one, two, four. We're looking at about five. No, that's not five inches. What is that scale there? Centimeters. We're looking at about eight centimeters, maybe between seven and eight centimeters there on this track. And what you can also notice is on each toe, where we can see two flat toes there, each toe very, very flat footed or flat toed if I can say that, and also looks like it's direct registered once again. And down the middle, you can see a very, very faint line there. So these toes are very tightly pressed up against one another. And so 
It does make quite a characteristic uh, track. Now, Rhonda, you say that it's shaped like a heart. It is indeed. But here, just a little bit on the outside there, you can see where the front foot is actually pressed and then the back foot having come and stepped right on the inside of it. So that gives us a good indication that it is one of the tragular fiends or the spiral horned antelope. And when we're looking at this kind of size, we would be thinking um, between Nyala and Kudu. So that would be what we're going for there. Um, and another thing that we do want to just have a look at is where is the widest part of the track. And this one coming up a little bit towards the back. So about three quarters of the way, the widest part being about there before it starts curling uh, again on the inside. So between Nyala and Kudu, um, and I would have to definitely say that I think that this is more so um, a, a female Kudu track um, because just of the way that it's so pressed or so tight between the toes like that, making that very clear little ridge there uh, between the toes. But a nice uh, um, characteristic track between Nyala and Kudu, very difficult to tell between them. Now, just to look uh, at, a, at a very clear-cut difference, um, it's a nice hard substrate here. So um, we just put the, the same leatherman. Here we've got a track, um, but it's almost like we can only see the outside of it there. Um, and very indicative of, a, of an impala track. We say that they walk on their rims or on the edges of their toes there and there. So this is an impala track, and they do not direct register. They're not one of the tragalophenes, so um, quite easy to distinguish an impala track as well. Now, there's also something, a little track over here. Now, Robin, you say carrying a Leatherman is genius. Well, I never leave home without it, Robin. Uh, so, yes, uh, I would say it's genius, but uh, it almost goes without saying for me nowadays. Um, and I never leave home, as I say, without it. Now, looking at this little track, I'll have to actually get something smaller because uh, my stick is almost too big. Here, we can see a little back pad over there. And then we've got a toe there. Well, another one there, another one there, and another one there. And on this back pad here, we can see that it's slightly lopsided like that, and possibly even something over there as well. This is that of a little dwarf mongoose. So very, very nice. And there's lots of little uh, tracks along here. You just have to look very closely. And so from our eyes down on the ground, let's put your eyes up into the trees. Quite a very beautiful small animal, the squirrel. It's busy trying to have a little bit of diet. It's right on top of the russet bush willow. So the squirrels are one of the very clever small mammals. They don't hibernate during the winter season simply because they can be able to collect quite a lot of food. They catch and they also take quite a lot of nuts and they hide them somewhere here in between the trees and also on the ground. These animals have got a very interesting anti-theft precaution whereby they are going to dig quite a lot of uh, false holes just to mislead uh, their onlookers when they're hiding and they bury and rebury their food every time. They've got good memory because if he's going to bury something by April this year in order to use it now during the winter season, you can see that they must have to be having a good memory. So they also secrete some of the scent in order to uh, remember where they're hiding the food. So I've got to take some questions now from the FC. Uh, I didn't copy nicely the, the name of the uh, viewer who just asked me now a question about my favorite sightings since I have joined the Wild Earth team. Murphy, my favorite sighting since I've joined Juma Wild Earth team uh, is 
the day I saw the lions together with uh, Tandy chasing each other uh, right by Central Road in the middle of the game reserve. That has been my best sighting because that day it was punctuated with cats chasing each other, lions chasing lepers, three lepers also appeared, uh, two lepers were also fighting. It was very much interesting to see those uh, kind of activities and I never saw it happening before. It's only here in Juma where I got that chance. Yeah, so now um, the squirrel just got disappeared and I will be now heading to Central and see what is happening there. And uh, thank you very much, Mafi, for such a lovely question. That sighting uh, is good memories to me. Yeah, so now uh, I will be heading towards the eastern side of the game reserve and see what we can find. Tandi is quite a little bit far away from where I am at this stage, so maybe before we get there we might come across other interesting things on the road. I haven't seen yet any of the big animals here. Uh, maybe animals are now down at the water hole. Uh, Tiffany, the African wild uh, cat, the size of the track is quite very small. But if you look at it nicely, it does resemble this, the, the shape of the big cats. It has got the three, antelope, the three loops as well, similar like the big cats. So it's not that very big. And it does confuse when thinking about animals such as civets. So it means if I find it, I've got to look very carefully before I come up with a judgment. Not even an impala here. So it's, it's quite hot today and then animals, in order to avoid this kind of uh, temperature, some, they go and find some nice shade and and chew some card and some of them they've got to go to the water hole so since i've started i haven't seen any of the antelopes Yeah, so now while I'm going towards Tandy, let's hear if Ralph, my colleague on the other side, got something already. Okay, everyone, we've just managed to find something very exciting. And what I want you to do is just look through those branches over there and you're going to see uh, the animal that we have been tracking. And there's a few of them there. And I do believe that it is the Nkuhuma pride. They've moved just a little bit from this morning, um, just a little bit further into the quarries, but uh, not too far. And this looks like a young male just watching us. Looks like he had a bit of a sneeze there. Yep, another one. How is that, eh? Walking lions on foot. And I can tell you what, Ooh, there's another one up in the background as well. Just gone off and gone and lay in the shade. Maybe it's getting a bit hot, but I can tell you what. I can tell you what. It's uh, one of the most amazing things to walk lions on foot. And it's normally a little bit of an anti-climax, actually, because I can tell you, if I to go towards these lions, they'll probably just get up and run away from us. So it's not that we're terribly... Um, concern to be in such close proximity. You can see the more the concern uh, coming from the lions uh, watching us. But we've got nice brush between us and them, so nothing for either of us to worry about. And we'd always just watch their body language in terms of how relaxed they are with us. If they had, to, oh, and there comes a nice big yawn as well. Now, grateful bad, you say I must walk softly and carry a big stick. I've got a little stick with me, um, uh, and I will walk softly as well. But um, 
We've been doing this for years, so it's absolutely fascinating. I still love it. I still enjoy it every single time I do it. And it just makes me proud to be African and just be with these guys out on foot. Welcome, welcome to all the viewers. Now, we are coming to you live from the Juma Traverse in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. You're watching Safari Live. My name is Ralph Kirsten, and we've, uh, we've just walked in on a pride of lions on foot. And you can see very relaxed at the moment, just carrying on with their business. And, well, we've come in with the sun over our shoulders, with the wind at our, uh, into our face. And now you can see that the line, obviously, just moving a little bit away from us. But it might also be as a result of the sun being quite warm today. And the lions will generally seek a little bit of shade at the moment. You see, he's not running away, so it's not like he's terribly concerned. Uh, about us being here look he's just going to be joining the rest of the pride going and lying down in the shade there this being the Unkahuma pride they also will um, just be probably about five females maybe six youngsters now, Mark Turner, you say hello, Mama Lions. I'm just going a little bit closer, but we'll keep this brush between us and them just to make sure that they are nice and comfortable and also that we have a bit of a safe zone as well. So we won't be going any further than this point here because we've got lovely ground between us and them. They, we don't want to disturb them, and we obviously don't want to put ourselves in danger either. Now, Patrick from Toronto, welcome, welcome. I hope that you can enjoy with us a little bit of a feeling of Africa. And this uh, really makes me proud to be South African and African at large because, uh, well, uh, where else could you walk lines on like this on foot? Totally wild, totally free. These lines are t um, really in their natural habitat. It's quite difficult through there into the brush to see them very clearly now, but uh, it's not as easy to get uh, in close proximity with lions on foot as it might be with a vehicle. They are a lot more relaxed with a vehicle. Now, Michelle, you, you're asking if, if you think that they see us. Michelle, they not only see us, they, they hear me now talking as well. You can see some of their tails flicking there. Um, but uh, there's, there's absolutely no uh, sort of aggressive signs towards us, not really stressed. There's a couple of little eyes just watching us. But we've got the wind in our face and the sun over our shoulder. So they're obviously struggling a little bit to see us in fine detail, but they definitely know that we're here. But with us keeping this bit of brush uh, and, and very clear vegetation between us and them, uh, if we had to break this, then they might get up and run away. Either that or they could charge us. So it would normally be a fight or flight, but uh, mostly flight. Now, Carolyn, you say that we're very lucky. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, and, uh, well, I, I think that every day when I'm out here walking amongst elephants and lions and leopard and buffalo, it is absolutely fascinating. Now, there were some buffalo around earlier that it seems like these Unkuhumas were following, but they seem to have moved off. Now, Prashant, you're asking why we call them the, the, the king of the jungle when, when they actually live in the savanna or in, in the bush. Well, I think they just use jungle as a, as a term like we do here in South Africa, um, as, a, uh, as a term for the wilderness. Um, so I would say that it's just the king of the wilderness. But also remember that lions used to be one of the most wildly spread cats of all. They used to find them in Britain and in Asia and even in Russia. Uh, but they have all been killed in all of those places. That's why it's the British lions. And th they have that as a symbol for many uh, different of their sporting teams, etc. Um, so they used to be there, but they obviously... Um, 
Now, Raya, you say that their camouflage game is very strong. Absolutely, look at that. You do need to have a very trained eye and uh, enabling you to see them and uh, it takes a lot of practice and well if you keep on joining us here on safari live you'll also get to practice with us so i'm just going to say goodbye to all the viewers on the different platforms um, and please join us once again for another safari live Okay, so just welcome back to all the regular viewers. That was just a quick action broadcast. Obviously very exciting for us just to come in here with these lions on foot. Uh, it's always special and always worth documenting. So if any of you want to send that little clip on over to your friends, you will find it on the um, uh, Safari Live uh, Facebook page. And so nice to just send those little action broadcasts, as we say. But uh, not too much action at the moment. Uh, lots of sleeping, as lions do in the middle of the day. And I, th I do believe that that's pretty much what they're going to be doing for the rest of the day. Now, at least James has got his vehicle fixed on up. So let's head over to him. I've got my vehicle fixed and I've got a leopard, the same leopard we started the show with. Now, let us not become blasé about having a leopard lying on our doorstep. This is not something that is going to last forever. It's, I don't know how long it's going to last. I hope it's going to last for at least until the beginning of our TV show on the 27th of July. That's Friday evening next for you lot. Uh, in the United States, Nat Geo Wild, 11 o'clock Eastern Time, PM, that is. Uh, it will be about, well, 5 in the morning here uh, in on Saturday. And then for the next five weeks after that, we will be doing a one-hour TV show from the Mara and from Juma. Very exciting. And we're hoping very much that uh, that cat you can see there sleeping like a celebrity is uh, going to be the celebrity of the show. I don't know, Sharon. What is wrong with his right lip? Hmm? I, I, has he got an injury there? I'm afraid I haven't spent any time with him over the last few days. If he does have a cut or something on the top lip or bottom lip, it'll probably be from his father giving him a swat. Yeah, let's wait for him to stick his head up, but I, I don't know about any injury there. Now, distressingly, I'm not sure how distressing it is, but uh, it sounds like Sydney's found a scavenger, which possibly means the Tundi has moved. I have got a very interesting sighting here. I have been led by the hyena. Hyena led me to a carcass, and soon as the hyena got to the tree, a leopard stood up and come back to defend the food. There is the hyena now moving towards uh, this direction of the reserve, which is the western side, but it just stops there. So how I saw where the carcass is, it was very interesting because the hyena came closer, stopped, and he was sniffing from the air. And he was sniffing the air particles coming from the direction where the food is kept by the the leopard. You can see now we have got a, a Tandy there. She was not there when we got there. She came soon as the hyena got close to the tree. Yeah, this is quite a very uh, beautiful sighting. I didn't see where the hyena got disappeared to, but now 
I can see that uh, Tandy is uh, very much relaxed there. I'm just going to try by all means and see if we can find a uh, Kalamba. So let me just try and pull a little bit much more to this side and see if we can have a, a better sighting. Uh, yeah, from... Uh, giraffe girl, uh, that is true. Tandy is not a happy girl at this stage because she had to come and defend the carcass. I'm sure she was very relaxed. She was sleeping somewhere not very far away from the tree because she came very quickly. But I can see the hyena is still in the area. It's also very relaxed, waiting to get a chance. So he's also lying down here, not very far away from where I am. You can see just the the stomach breathing. You can see the movement there. The stomach is breathing. So that hyena didn't go very far. It's still very here waiting to get a chance. Maybe this hyena is hungry as well. I'm not too sure if Tandy is with Kalamba nearby at this stage, but I will try by all means and see if Kalamba is also around here because they were seen together earlier on. <laughs> yes, and the comment from Ivy, that is very true. Tandy is not going to allow anybody to take a chance when it comes to the food. Specifically when Tandy has got Kalamba, Kalamba must have to eat. You can see she's very much relaxed now, but the focus, the eyes, where she's looking, that direction is where that hyena is hiding at the moment. Uh, Saul, yes, that is true. The hyenas, they have just been to all over the place trying to irritate and to try and get hold of all the food caught by this leopard. They are just all over Juma Game Reserve. They are depending on this uh, kind of cats. They are trying by all means. It's just that leopards are well much gifted. They are very skilled climbers. They take their food up to, to a tree to avoid competition, which is a good thing. Why I'm saying it's a good thing because they don't hunt as a team. So they are very much solitary. So killing an animal for just one leopard is a big job. So they're going to have to enjoy the reward. If someone come and take the food afterwards, to me, it's, it's not nice. But that is how animals live. Hyenas, because they don't catch a lot, they depend on the other ones. That is how they live. Nature is like that. We might not see it fair, but that is how it works. Look at that. So these cats can hear very well and they can see very nicely. Uh, I have got a question from Pauline. Uh, Pauline, since I have started now with this game drive, I haven't picked up any signal of the vultures flying around. I have been looking around here to try and get guidance from these natural factors. Because when there's a kill, there's, there's quite a lot of things that lead us. If it was not the hyena, it was going to be very difficult for me as well to see where the kill is. But the birds at this stage is very quiet. Nothing is happening. No vultures and no other big birds such as battalions. I have seen the vultures and battalions on the past few uh, days leading us to where the carcasses are. But today it's just very quiet. You 
can see Tony is 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 is, is growing, eh? That is very beautiful. So I'm not. I'm, I'm very worried because I cannot see Kalamba, and they have been seen together here earlier. So maybe the little one is hiding somewhere nearby. Yeah, let's now see if James uh, has got uh, Osana on the other side yet. Well, yes, James does have Osana. Um, he struggled struggle to lose Osana. Even I would struggle to lose Osana at this point, given how flat cat he is. He has not moved one muscle, not an inch, not an ear. He might be moving his diaphragm very slowly in up and down so that he can breathe. The light is slowly softening on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. And in case you're wondering, there are two other game drive vehicles in the sighting. Oh, I must just call this in, sorry. Um, I'm just going to quickly call in the Tundi sighting. Stations Tundi is on site, same place as this morning, Lidwood Road, Junction, Drakensberg. There we go. I didn't hear anyone else calling it in, so that's important. But our cat here is uh, doing absolutely nothing. Gary, I, I don't know. Um, I suppose, perhaps, if he produces offspring one day, they may have elements of his character. Certainly leopards do seem to be genetically very different from birth, uh, from a personality point of view. They are, well, they, they seem to be born with a, a personality in much the same way as we are. And uh, while I've no doubt that experience modifies and molds that personality, uh, they definitely do seem to be different from the very beginning. It's not a sort of blank slate, as it were. So I suspect there must be a genetic component of that uh, attached to, you know, the cat, depending on uh, what they t take from their mothers or fathers. I'm really getting a because I'm thinking to myself, do I know people who are angry uh, with angry parents, you know, short-tempered people with short-tempered parents? I'm actually just thinking of my brother who, um, well, not short-tempered, but he certainly has a tendency to grumpiness that is very reminiscent of my father. I, of course, am never grumpy. So, yes, I would say that uh, if his personality remains as it is, remember that he's still a young leopard, he's not a territorial leopard yet, and his personality may not always be quite as confiding, but uh, you may well find that he produces offspring that are quite friendly, unlike his sister Tundi, who I find quite unfriendly. Magnificent. Don't get me wrong. Before you all roll your eyes and say, how dare he say that about our queen. Uh, I, I do think she's magnificent, but I don't think she's the friendliest cat in the world. Yeah, Margarita, what you'll find is that None of these animals sleep anything like as soundly as we sleep. What happens is that they doze, but if there's a cracking branch next to him or there's a, an unusual gust of wind or a, the snort of some potential prey animal, uh, he will definitely hear it and he'll shoot up. They cannot afford to sleep soundly like we do. All of the sounds that he can hear right now are familiar to him, so he's not going to worry about those. If I started the car, he knows what that means. If I speak loudly, he knows what that means. So the only thing that's going to make him wake up would be unfamiliar or potentially threatening sounds or potentially advantageous sounds, like the snort of an impala or the footfall of a, uh, a hoofed animal. So that is possible. 
The only animals that I've seen sleeping as soundly as human beings are lions. Because they have so little to fear, they will sleep like the dead. Ears don't not twitching, and I've walked past lions uh, inadvertently who have not woken up as I've gone past them. They probably don't sleep quite as soundly as human beings, but they certainly do sleep. And whether or not, I don't think they hear nearly as much as a leopard does in his sleep, for example. A cheetah, you'll seldom see sleeping restfully. Always lifting the head, looking around, closing eyes a little bit, lifting the head, looking around. Must be absolutely exhausting. I cannot believe this, but Ralph Kirsten is still with his pride. So everyone, we've, um, we've managed to get ourselves a little bit into the shade and uh, sitting in the quarry thickets with these lions probably between 30 and 40 meters away from us. Now, they're just watching us and there's also uh, quite a few little warthogs running, running around all over the place. So who knows, we might even sit here with them and witness a little bit of a hunt. Wow, how lucky would that be? But uh, we're not going to jinx it. Uh, we're just going to sit here and enjoy being in the company of lions. It's absolutely fantastic. What more could you ask for? They are indeed quite curious with us. Uh, Margarita, um, uh, yeah, I don't think that these lines uh, would particularly take too much interest in us. Um, you know, in the 20 years that I have been actively uh, working as a professional in the field, um, I've walked and done this many times with lions, and you generally find that they, uh, they, they, you know, they can go from uh, curious to um, being a little bit nervous. Uh, to either getting a, a little bit agitated that you're around um, but I've never had the sense that they in any way think that I'm um, any kind of food for them so it's uh, it's never a worry in the sense of that they're going to eat us uh, the worry is always um, if you go near to lions with little cubs um, or lions on a kill or lions that are mating wow look at that nice big yawn that was very cool. Um, so those are the three major things that you want to avoid. Lions with cubs, lions on a kill, and mating lions. And I've walked in on all three of those kind of lions. Um, and they will normally give you just a, a very loud, uh, loud growl and uh, sometimes very sharp, uh, sharp bursts of, of uh, speed, you know, trying to get rid of you. That's all. So they give you those warning signs. But... Um, these lions at the moment, they are very relaxed. I think uh, a couple of these youngsters are a little bit curious about us, but uh, they do keep their eye on us, and it's, it's more so them being more cautious of us. Now, Carol, normally in this pride, I think there's 11. Uh, I think it's five females with six youngsters, and there's a mix of, of females and males in there. Uh, but I haven't seen if they're all together here. I would assume so. Um, so they're scattered around a little bit in the, in the brush. Um, so we do need to just keep our eyes open that we wouldn't be flanked by them. But as I say, it's not, uh, not for them to be hunting us. Um, and they're more so scared of us, which is uh, always important uh, as humans. We like to keep animals' fear uh, and their natural fear of us because that's pretty much our only real security against them. Um, and it's when uh, these animals get habituated or, or used to people that they become more dangerous because you can get closer to them without them giving you a warning and, uh, and then obviously your reaction time is less because you're closer to them and uh, it's also that they're going to be much quicker upon you uh, if they decide that uh, they don't want you around anymore. So. The rule is, as I said earlier, always uh, an animal's defense is going to be fight or flight and generally they'll avoid conflict and so they will run away using the flight but um, sometimes they can, depending on the situation, uh, decide to fight. Um, so you just watch their body language but with them yawning and now even looking like they might go back to sleep, uh, they are definitely relaxed in our proximity to them. 
So I'm going to stay here because it's absolutely wonderful to be in the presence of lions. Even though they're relaxed, maybe they will get a hunting a little bit later. But it uh, seems like Sydney's leopard is on the move. Uh, things, things are happening here on my side. We just hear a little bit of noise coming from this direction. And uh, Talamba picked up the noise and started running away all the way up to this side. And Tandi woke up and decided to follow Talamba. So we're not too sure what these two are up to at the moment. Tandi as well was not too sure what is it that Talamba is trying to respond to. But we hear the noise. You can see Kalamba there. Uh, there's a question from Danny. Uh, the, the lepers, uh, I'm not too sure specifically of the age, but these other playing activities a lot is taking place when they are up to 18 months. From 18 months is when they learn a lot of things, including hunting activities. So it's one of those animals that are getting all the knowledge from playing. So you can see there now is is uh, is playing. I'm sure it's looking for some insects there. It means they it was not anything serious. Uh, James Littlewood, thank you very much for such a comment. Yes, we all got cats at the moment. It's quite a very big achievement. Look at that. If you look at the tip of that tail, it's white. That white color you are seeing there is used mostly by the adults when they are calling the babies. The tail of these animals can tell you the mood. You see, they use these tails uh, for communication a lot. And the tip of the tail has got white where the adults, they, they raise their fluffy hairs to show the little one we are going to this side. You can easily read the mood of an animal from the tail. Listen to that. Quite a beautiful cat. I'm not too sure if at this stage the uh, Kalamba knows that the tail can serve a big purpose. Uh, Nasi, the hyena, we left it right about 10, 15 meters away from the tree where the carcass is, is held. So the hyena is still there. I'm sure now the hyena must be up sniffing, looking at the carcass. It's a pity the hyenas cannot be able to climb up there. It's quite a very straight tree, no broken branch to support the hyena to get hold of the food. You can see they can easily come off -ledged. It's difficult to see when it's not moving behind those trees. Uh, Ashley, the lepers, as soon as they get to 22 months, from 22 months onwards, anything can happen because that is when they're starting to mature. And once they get matured, it's when they start to demarcate territories and start now to uh, establish their own families. So the lepers, they can be together with the family between two to three years. That is where now they're starting to leave those kind of families. Interesting to see Kalamba just playing, going over these broken trees. 
So I can't see where Tani is, but I'm sure Tani is somewhere not very far away, uh, giving some protection for in case if anything can happen to uh, Galamba. Cats can be very much protective. A child of the universe, I didn't get the question very nicely. If FC, you can give me that question again. So uh, if the question is about growing, the lepers, they can grow and weigh, the, the fully grown ones can weigh up to 90 kilograms. So Talamba has got a long way to grow. She's still very much young. So let me see if I can reposition myself here so that we can have a better sighting. Yes, I'm just going to reverse now so that I can give my camera operator, Fergus, an opportunity to give you a better sighting. So now while I'm reversing, uh, maybe we can see what other colleagues are having on the other side. I think James has got something interesting. I have got the crested barbette. Look at him. Is he not magnifique? A beautiful bird of scruffiness and beautiful colours. We've left Hosanna. Uh, just briefly, we'll go back to him at some stage. He is, of course, fast asleep. And that bird is just too magnificent for words. And he's got his little mohawk up for Sunday. He's very pleased to be safe where he is. very regal or oh, he's try you know what he's attempting to look regal I'm not sure that a crested barber could ever look particularly regal they're just a little scruffy yes Ali I have found Tristan's angry bird that is correct my angry bird is the barred owlet which looks very serious and very angry all the time like the chicken hawk interesting from time to time my phone seems to think that I'm asking it a question shut up I'm not asking you a question it went beep beep I'm sorry I don't understand what you said And the other thing that we have over here, other than the beautiful bird, is a somewhat macabre scene over there. Zephyr, they are fun little birds indeed. They're one of my favourites. Again, they remind me of sort of the touch of the wilderness that was allowed by the gardens that we used to have in Johannesburg, the big city where I grew up. There is the carcass that there was so much angst about both between father and son and of course it attracted the hyenas for a long time they've dropped it into a place that they will not be able to retrieve it it's on some very sort of thin twigs and there's not much left but that impala i don't think is going to come down from there until the tree releases it i don't think anything's going to be able to get up there to to get hold of it except maybe a genet maybe a genet would get hold of it It'd be quite fun to watch Hosanna try, though, wouldn't it? Anyway, that's a bit miserable. Let's carry on. Oh, no, let's not. Unfortunately, the poor old... The, the poor old crested barbet has been chased by a squirrel. Goodbye, squirrel. Let us go back off to the east to the leopardess and her baby.
it's very much interesting to see Talamba taking over the responsibility of where to go and what to do. These sleepers were very much relaxed and a call was heard. Kalamba decided to go and since then she is responsible. The mother is just following everywhere. Mother is just joining her on what she is doing. You can see that the, the cub is so very much interested on play and the mother is not interested. But this, this gives Kalamba an opportunity to learn quite a lot of survival skills. When they are playing, they can be able to learn to survive in the jungle. So they can easily adapt with the environment. Look at that. Ah, this is uh, so beautiful. So I just want to see what is going to happen and what is the intention of uh, Kalama because she is responsible here. She's the one who decided to come this side. So I want to see what is uh, her thought. Now she is taking the orders. She is following the mother now, Tandi. You can see she's slowly going down there. Tandy is somewhere ahead of her. Look at that. You can see she's... Uh, Hazel, I didn't check. I didn't get the um, question nicely. Uh, I hear this about the sounds. I'm, I'm not too sure, Hazel, uh, when it comes to uh, the number of sounds the cats can be able to analyze at a time. So that one I have got to investigate and check how they do it. But what I know is that the cats, they can easily analyze and they can hear very well. They can even see very well. Now they are hiding. You can see they are getting very much camouflaged. So let me just pull forward and see if we can have a good sighting. Oh, they're somewhere hiding, somewhere, somewhere. Oh, there they are. Uh, Paula, uh, nothing is happening at the moment because here it seems like it's all about playing. Kalaba just want to have a little bit of some exercise. And I can see the mother looks very tired, not much interested on play today. So it's, it is very much quiet here. Yeah? Not no beds, nothing, no small animals. So they're not hunting. They're just playing. So you can see there now Kalamba is, is back again moving towards that side. You can see that Kalamba is very much interested on in something. It's coming back again. Uh, Robin, that is very true. Their senses are very much sharp. Cats, they are well gifted when it comes to their senses. Look at that. That is cute. It's 
looking at this side. So she can hear uh, someone approaching. You can see the ears are moving every time. <laughs> so you can see now that she's very much camouflaged. Look at that. She's trying to hide away from... She's trying to hide away uh, from a little bit of uh, noise. So I can see it's now moving back to the bundus. It's moving back to the bush. Uh, Safari South, the leopards, I'm not too sure if the tongue comes very uh, rough, but if you can check the, the females, there's something very interesting about the tongue they are doing to the cubs. You will see after birth, these females, they lick their little ones and they always keep licking them when they're still very young. They do that for a reason. When they're licking the little ones is when they are helping for the blood circulation and also activate the excretory organs. The saliva of the mother also gives the little one a lot of vitamin D. So now God disappeared. So they are now all moving back to uh, the thick bushes. Yeah, now uh, let's see if maybe James, my colleague on the other side, got something. I will just now go back and see if there is any other activities taking place where the carcass is held. Well, the activity taking place here is some eating and some looking by the impala. Since all the viewers do not wish to look at my face, they wish to look at the animals over here, if possible. My face is the least most appealing thing on this game drive. There we go. Making their way in the winter, varying their diets, Now that tree that they're eating there is Gymnosporia buxifolia and Gymnosporia buxifolia is known for very very high tannin content and somehow these impala are managing to cope with those tannins it's quite a feat, it's an impressive feat I mean those things are so bitter you wouldn't want to put them in your mouth at all you may not want to anyway you definitely wouldn't like to bite on them or chew them. Look at that face, isn't it wonderful? Look at the detail and the colours. So sweet. Look at the colours, the blacks and whites and browns. Well, you're looking at them, Minamu. These animals are more common here than they are in the Mara. I'm trying to think of another one. I think mammal-wise, it's probably only this one. Well, except, I mean, you don't get Nyala there, so Nyala would be much more common here, I suppose. Perhaps the common Dyker as well would be more common per hectare. I didn't see many in the Mara. But the obvious, obvious sort of comparison is the number of Impala that we have here versus the number of Wilden Beast that there are in the Mara. Many, many hundreds of thousands of Wilden Beast and a few hundred thousand impalas here. 
So I think that would be, yeah, that would probably be the best answer. But you do get some species that occur in one place and not in the other. And so therefore, by default, they will occur in greater numbers where they occur. Well, Ashley, there are all sorts of reasons for why impala might have black on their buttocks. One is for heat regulation. The other is that if you look at that, those... In fact, let's do an experiment. Um, Senzor, please can you put the thermal camera on the bottom of that impala? Now, what we want to see is whether or not the black stripes are hotter than the white bits. Is that, we don't have any zoom on there, do we? Senzel? Ah, we do. Thank you very much. Okay, let's just wait. Now, obviously, naturally, we can't see the bottom of an impala. That's it. Move away. Move aside. Yes. Okay, so those black spots are warmer than some of the rest of the impala. They're not... No, they're not, actually. They're cooler. I did hear at one stage that because they're black they reflect more heat in theory and therefore the ticks would be attracted to those parts of the body and then when the impala flicked its tail it would flick the ticks off. Now there were a number of issues with that theory that I had. Firstly of course you know I've watched an impala f flick its tail and I've also tried to pick ticks off myself and I just didn't believe that they would be able to flick the ticks off with their tails and now we have, well, I think fairly effectively proved that the hottest part of a Nyala's behind is behind its tail, which is precisely where you'd expect to find ticks. So why they have those black stripes on their bottoms probably has to do with a following mechanism of some sort or some sort of camouflage. The default for any guide when asked why has an animal got a marking on the backside or visible from behind is to say, well, it must be a following mechanism so that they can follow each other when they are running away from predators. But that is not necessarily true. It's just a theory that humans have come up with. Uh, so that's one of them. The other is that, of course, any kind of striping will break up an outline in a woodland environment. So they're not striped on their bodies, but they are striped behind, and perhaps when they're running away from their predators, that striping helps slightly uh, to mask where they're running in woodland. I think that's probably all I can say on that particular matter. Let's continue. Senzo, unless you wish to add anything. Yeah, I'd love to add, uh, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, would, you would agree with me, would you? I, I thought we were about to get a pearl of wisdom there. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Ralphie is having a wonderful afternoon. Let's go across to him again. Oh yes, it's been absolutely awesome, folks, just relaxing with the Sunkuhuma Pride. Um, and they are very relaxed with our presence. There's the odd one that just puts its head up and watches us. Um, but as I say, it's just as a result of them not being uh, too comfortable with those strange animals that walk on two legs. And they do have a very natural fear of us. And that's actually very good for us, because I wouldn't want uh, these lions not to have that little bit of cautious nature towards us, otherwise we'd be in trouble. But I can honestly say that this is one of the sort of best encounters that you would have if you had to come out to South Africa and you go on a bushwalk. This is the kind of distance that you can expect to um, get to lions as, as, as a closest. You wouldn't be getting any closer than this. Um, uh, sometimes you can have a, a bit of a clearer view of them. Maybe they're out on the rocks or, you know, and you can get a view. Of, maybe you can be on an elevated position or so on. But uh, every situation is different, um, and you always just take it uh, as you can. But um, bushwalks not generally uh, for the best close-up photos of the big five. It's more to get like, um, as as I always used to say to my students, uh, you're you're um, 
you're driving around when you are driving around in the game reserve you're sort of driving around the animals houses but at the moment we've gone inside their house uh, when we go on foot and we're scratching around at the moment right inside the lion's bedroom uh, so we do need to be a little bit more cautious uh, when we're doing that because they're obviously going to react quite a lot differently in their personal space so uh, they uh, and they obviously do just watch us a little bit like that through the bushes. Now, Peter, you say that uh, you don't blame them um, from uh, avoiding humans, or so do you. Well, uh, yeah, uh, Peter, the every man for himself. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, you know, animals and humans, and, and, and we can be quite, quite nasty creatures, can we, as humans. But we can also be absolutely amazing. And, uh, and, and uh, so I, I just think that if I, if I put across to them that I don't mean them any harm, um, then uh, they're going to do the same to me. And if I respect the wild animals, well, and I, and I always do, then I, I pretty much can stand my ground uh, because I don't mean them any harm and I'm showing them all the respect they deserve. So I would expect the same back from them. And I think that's a good way to go through life. Now, Tajo, you want to know, uh, you know, this that story has been peddled, um, you know, for a very long time that lions and, and a lot of animals can smell fear. I don't, I don't believe that that is true. Uh, I think it's more to do with a kind of body language and a reaction, uh, the way that you react to their presence. Uh, I think the animals can very, pick, very easily pick up if you are scared. Um, and that goes with the way that you uh, present yourself. How do you react? To being around them uh, do you look like you're scared um, and it's very easy actually to pick up somebody that looks scared and if the lion moves forward do you back off do you stand your ground do you get a fright you know all these kind of things it's very easy to pick up and when when your senses are as acute as a lion's you can very easily see an animal's reaction to your presence and as soon as they get the upper hand for instance if they were to get up and band together and come towards us and we had to jump up and move off well then obviously they'd know that we're scared now everyone i think we've spent uh, a good amount of time here with them we're going to be making our way out of here and call the vehicles in and while we do that let's head you off to james with the birdie with a woodland kingfisher not a woodland king why can i never say it right the first time round? that is the brown hooded kingfisher and there is a squirrel shouting close by and some chin spot batises having a little bit of a crossy and so maybe Tangana is close by that's why we've come down this area in the meantime let us just observe the joy of the woodland <laughs> the brown hooded kingfisher looking for insects on the ground in amongst the dung no, quite a subtly coloured kingfisher, this one, the brown hooded. Doesn't have quite the spectacular sort of um, bronzes and pinks and purples of the malachite or the halcyon blue of the uh, woodland kingfisher, but it is one of the halcyon kingfishers. There's much bird alarm calling around here. I'm just going to drive forward slightly. Mr. Kingfish, I'm afraid, is going to fly off. Let's just look into these thickets and see if we can't spot what is causing the angst amongst... No, Wendy. Amongst the birds. So we'll just look from side to side, see if we can't find the telltale white belly of Tingana, the sleepy male leopard. Seems to be very sleepy a lot of the time these days, as does his son. Yeah. Got that in common for sure. I will
we'll keep having a look here. Sydney remains with the Queen and her daughter. Tandy is not completely free at the moment. I can see that uh, uh, she is worried a little bit about the hyena in the area uh, since the little one started displaying quite a lot of playing activities. So now she decided to then climb a dead branch and face the direction where the hyena is, is hiding at the moment. You can see every time she's, she's checking She's trying to investigate each and every noise here. So she is not happy at the moment. She's not comfortable at all. You can see the eyes are very much clear and sharp. These cats can see about seven times than a human being. And apart from that, they, their irritability is good. They've got a very good hearing. They can hear approximately five times than we do. So each and everything the hyena is doing, any movement, any noise, this cat is going to pick it up. Look at those whiskers. So those whiskers, they are not there just for a decoration. They've got a very important responsibility to play. When this cat is going in between the trees, it's using the whiskers to measure the gaps. I've got a comment from Robin. Tandy is always on watch. Yes, that is very true. The leopards, when having the little ones, is quite a responsibility. So if, it, if they don't watch out, chances of losing the little ones are very much high. Hyenas can be very much problematic. Look at that. Look at how he's sleeping there. This is quite a very beautiful sighting. So there is no tracks showing me that this leopard went to the water hole earlier on. They have been here since this morning. They caught a steen bog and they have been feeding here. They are not that very much water dependent. These cats, they do get quite a lot of moisture from the food they eat. Uh, Eben H7, uh, the lepers, they only meet the males during the mating season. They don't get married and stay together for a long time. Only during the season of breeding, they, they come together and they split again. So the males, they are not responsible to come and feed the little ones. You know, it's, it's more or less the same as my culture. Uh, in Venda, we we have got kids, but we normally take the kids away and leave them with their grandmothers. The grandmothers is the ones that are responsible to grow the little ones. Yes, we must have to take the accountability of taking the kids to school and buy the food, but who must have to spend much time with the kids is the grannies. Mother and father, they don't play a very significant role. When growing the little ones, we give the little ones to the grannies. Grandmothers are the ones that are responsible to take care of the little ones. So here, mothers are responsible to take care of the little ones. It is quite a lovely sighting. I hope they, they're going to wake up and go up to a tree and have a meal in a very short space. 
Look at that. That leopard looks like it's completely sleeping. So Malika, yes, indeed, is quite very much beautiful when the leopard's, leopard's legs are just hanging by the branches and the trees when they're sleeping. So the ears are very much conscious. They are sleeping like that, but if anything happens, any break stick, they will pick it up immediately. And they will act as if they were active, not lying down. They can be very much fast. That's how cats operate. And uh, Messi, uh, Kalamba, at this stage, I don't think uh, Tandi will be able to instruct Talamba to go up to a tree. Something you must have to uh, remember is that the little ones, sometimes the age of Talamba now is interested on too much play. When these little ones, when there's a threat, instead of hiding away, sometimes they want to see what's happening. So that's why... Uh, Tandi is facing that side because the one who came back to here where we are first, it was Tandi. But uh, it was Kalamba. But Tandi had to overtake Kalamba and work in front because uh, Tandi knows that little ones can, they like to try. Kalamba might try uh, to challenge anything coming. You know how little ones do things. It also happens to the animals. That is why when animals have got small babies, the chances of catching a prey are very much low because little ones always spoil the chance of hunting. They expose the strategies. So the, the hyena is still here and is also lying down flat. I can see the, it's just in the middle of those grasses, right there. He doesn't want to give up, you can see. Uh, Judy Kalamba is not yet strong enough to defend herself from the hyena, but as a small one, Kalamba can always try and check a chance because at this stage, Kalamba is not aware of the consequences of provoking other animals. The sign I, I saw earlier whereby Kalamba decided to jump and run away to where we were earlier when she was playing around. She decided to go and investigate the sound we heard by herself. And the mother was guided by Kalamba. That has shown me that Kalamba doesn't know, doesn't know yet how it works. She doesn't know the consequences of trying to investigate what is making noise at this stage. He's still very much young to understand that. So you can see that uh, they are not yet interested in feeding. They're just about a few meters away from the tree where the food is. Uh, next, yes, 100% for sure. Animals are very much well gifted. They can be able to distinguish between our voices and other voices. That is why some of the animals, if you are giving them problems, once they pick up your voice, they change into an aggressive mood. Because they learn to associate the voices uh, together with how we are treating them. Some can even be able to associate our body scent 
Every time they pick up the body scent, they react. They retaliate. But whereby the human are not a threat to them, they don't mind it. But if there is a, a, a breakdown of the relationship between human and the animals in those areas, is whereby when they pick up a human voice, they must just think about to defend themselves. This is quite a very beautiful pose. Look at that. Yeah, the animals can be very much... Yeah, indeed, this is a gorgeous, lovely sighting to me as well. I am falling in love with the cats here in Juma. The cats are so very much beautiful. I have been guiding uh, since 2007, and the interaction with cats, where I come from, is different. Here, I am seeing quite a lot of cats. There, I was battling to see cats almost every day. This is lovely. It's an ornament for me to find myself working for the Juma Game Reserve uh, Safari Live. Look at that. Yeah, now the, the cat is very much relaxed. I'm just going to wait and see what is going to happen. But for now, uh, we can go to my other colleagues and see what they have got around the game reserve. Well, everyone, it's often that this happens when you're busy walking or leaving a sighting. Um, you can very often find uh, one of the animals in a much better view than when you first started. And we have exactly that this time as well. Now, this female is nicely out in the open. We've just got grass between us and her, and she is very relaxed. Now, what I was meaning earlier or trying to uh, explain is... Um, to do with the body language now and look at this cat you can see the body language is that of a complete relaxed animal um, it's not to say that that couldn't change in an instant she could go from that uh, to a very aggressive animal in a, in a split second but you see how she's lying down um, the ears flicking every now and then for the uh, flies um, she's sometimes almost just closing her eyes a little bit um, so she's she's watching us but she's not too concerned um, and so we're obviously in a comfort zone um, if we had to walk towards her we could obviously get into a little bit more uh, you know critical now Ravinda if we wanted to get away from these lions or if they confronted us and maybe came towards us uh, the very important thing is to stand your ground um, and if they had to come aggressively you can maybe give a bit of a shout at them uh, but the major thing is to never back off if a lion's coming towards you uh, the only time that you would back off keeping your face uh, fronted towards them uh, would be when they turn around and move off or as they lie down like this one is doing here but if it's coming towards you you should not be running away or uh, even trying to leave the area you need to stand your ground that is the most important part that you need to always remember um, with lions it's like uh, if you pull a piece of string for a little kitty cat if you turn your head so um, we won't be doing that we'll be leaving this area uh, with our front towards them and uh, my cameraman and my game scout are both facing these cats but there is absolutely no reason for us to worry whatsoever so I think we're gonna head on out nice and slowly without disturbing them in the meantime off to James well the update I can give you is that we didn't find Tingana but we think he, we can hear him calling just north of where Hosanna is so that's very encouraging. 
he's probably still around. I'm going to go off to Tandi as well. That's simply because I have to record something for our upcoming TV show of uh, precisely 30 seconds. No longer, no shorter. And so we're going to go and do that. I was hoping to do that with Hosanna, but he is so flat, so asleep, so not doing anything that I'm going to go off and do it with Tandi and Tlalamba. But on the way there, we might discover some interesting creatures, which would be quite fun. We'll see what we find on the way. It's a gorgeous afternoon. It is a little chilly, I must say. This winter has been colder than I remembered the one before, but that's all right. Rosalind, yes, we do find giraffes, absolutely, from time to time. Sometimes there are many, sometimes you swear that uh, they've all forsaken us for no real reason. Uh, but we do find them, yes. And, uh, you know, every night that we've flown that thermal drone around the place, we have found giraffes lying down. Obviously with their heads up, but lying down. Very exciting to find them on the drone. But you know, if they're in the blocks, they're sometimes quite difficult to see, but we do see them regularly. Let's keep going down here. I'm going to drive at a relatively good speed because the light is now so absolutely magnificent that if we find Tandi and Tlalamba in this light, well, we'll get a wonderful promotion done. This is the one of the lowest points on Juma. No, Windu, I haven't heard anything about Anderson Mail after the loss of his eye. We don't even know how he lost his eye. Of course, could have been hyena, could have been the warthog, uh, perhaps could have been uh, our friend Tamba, who swatted him. We haven't heard how he's doing. There's some beautiful nyalas there. We're just going to keep going along here for a little while. Mm. The light is magical. And I don't think those grey clouds are holding any promise of any kind of rain. Of course, rain in winter is very unusual here. Lots of elephant tracks all over the road, which is nice had so many the other day walking through this area we did one elephant segment on foot and then all the way home we were walking in between herds it was quite scary it was getting dark but we survived Senzo was not with me that day were you Senzo? no all right I'm going to catch up with you where you are going now Tundi is still very much relaxed here where I am and uh, Kalamba just decided to walk away again and Kalamba walked away very silently. Tandi couldn't even get any information about the disappearance of Kalamba at this stage and I'm very quite sure that now Kalamba is about 250 to 300 meters away from Tandi. And this is something I was talking about earlier that at this stage the age of kalamba she's not yet too sure about the do's and the don'ts she's leaving the mother here trying to defend her against the hyena and now is walking all the way up 250 300 meters just playing around just by herself and i think that is, is a dangerous exercise because she is jeopardizing her own safety I can see that now Tandi has crossed the head a little bit. Uh, Safari South, the lepers, they, they've got to mate uh, for about approximately three, uh, approximately three days, consecutive days. And they must have to do a lot in 15 minutes.
So you can see that. Oh, now I can see the hyena is up there trying to sniff up. That is why now Tandy is uh, checking something. The hyena is up here now. It's trying to pick up something from the air particles. So these, these animals can be able to smell something, a dead carcass, very far away. Approximately four or five kilometers, they can smell a dead carcass. That's quite a very beautiful shot. Uh, Robin, at this stage, uh, it's only one hyena I have spotted. It's not a lot. And I think uh, they are still very much safe at the moment. And still, I can't see Tralamba. Just got disappeared like that. Uh, Sinek, the distance between the hyena and this uh, and Tandi here, I'm talking about less than it's up 25 meters or less. It's not a lot. And 25 meters is not a big distance. When the lepers are irritated, they can go very fast. Uh, John, I didn't get your question very well. If the FC can give me that question again. Uh, John, uh, that is true. The hyenas, they do get an unfair application. The, the, the fair reputation, you know, if there's an animal I have got to um, recommend for, uh, for, for, for re renaming, hyena was going to be one of them. I was going to uh, recommend that hyena because a lot of people, they associate hyenas with a lot of bad things. It is quite a very good animal. Some, they don't like them because they take away food from others, but that is how they have been designed. And some, they associate the hyena with the uh, evil stuff. And quite a lot of African tribes as well, they, they don't believe in hyenas. They think hyena is not a good animal. They believe hyena brings bad luck. Uh, Peter, uh, thanks for the question. I come from Venda. Venda is quite a very big area uh, because that is the area which is consisted of all the Venda speaking people. But amongst the, the Venda land, that is where I come from. There's some other villages. My village is very much big. Uh, in terms of kilometers, I can say uh, it's about, I can say it's about 25 kilometer square. So you can see now when the sun is shining, still focusing there. She doesn't want to reposition from what she's seeing that hyena. She wants to make sure that she's seeing what the hyena is tending to do. Each and every intention of the hyena is recorded. Yeah, indeed, it's quite a very a beautiful um, sun shining on this uh, leopard spot, the rosette. So each one of them has got its own stripe pattern, but it's not easy uh, to identify them.
So now I will be uh, checking any other development. Maybe Ralph has got something interesting on the other side. Well, we do. We've got a very relaxed kudu just up ahead here. I just want to see if we can just get out and get a better view on it again. Because it was really so relaxed with us very close to it, which is quite unusual. And it needs to be, she needs to be careful because the lions aren't far from here. So she could quite easily become dinner. There she is just feeding on in the bushes there. But I think if we actually walk a little bit forward and onto the road, we might get a nice clear visual on her. So let's just walk. And as I say, she's not worried about us at all, which is rather strange, maybe because it's a youngster. There we go. Let's just go a little bit more, Craig, and we might get a lacquer clear view here. Just out of here. She's watching us now. Look at those massive satellite dish ears, hey? Look at that. Wow. Little youngster, going to just carry on feeding. Pretty girl, huh? You can actually hear her chewing as well. You be careful, pretty girl, because those lions will have you for dinner. And I do think that they're going to hunt tonight. So you better make yourself scarce. And don't head where we were just coming from. I hope you head in the opposite direction. Or rather than take out one of those buffalo. Although that's discriminatory, isn't it? <laughs> kudu, buffalo, I think those lines will take what they can get. And this little kudu here would definitely be on the menu if it had to get too close to them or didn't spot them lying in the grass in the guari thickets. And it can be quite easily become dinner because she's also just feeding in the guaris and that's what she'll do, moving on over towards the lines. And if she's not alert and notice them, I'll very quickly grab her. Now, uh, Cenac, this kudu, I would say, is probably, you know, 8 to 12 months old. It's not very old at all. And kudu do grow extremely quickly. Um, and uh, I would definitely say that it's it's not much older than a year, uh, a year of age. Um, and I'm surprised there's no others around. Maybe there is some more a little bit further into the thickets there. But what is that? Is that a quarry that she's feeding on? I'll just have a quick look with my binos. Let's just see what she is taking bites off of there. No, it doesn't look, doesn't look like a quarry. I'm not quite sure if that's a star apple. It's another tree. She's obviously really enjoying those leaves there. I have to go closer, but I'll, I'll chase her off. I don't want to do that and ruin her mid-afternoon feed. Lovely light now starting to come through as well. Hello, girl. She's just got one like white lipstick on. It's like she's been eating ice cream. <laughs> or she's been drinking milk. Yeah. And it's strange. Also, you see the tail completely down now. It's brown, but when they get alarmed or uh, they are running through the bush, that tail will uh, almost flex right up onto their back. And th then it expo exposes this very white um, fur that's underneath. And then uh, very much like a white flag. Now, Noriko, um, yes, obviously, uh, right down the line, they would be related to giraffe um, and, and, and zebra, but it's, it's very far. Um, so this is part of the antelope, um, and giraffe and zebra, obviously, both not in that uh, category. These are related uh, more closely uh, to bushbuck, um, to uh, your nyala, um, so those are the real close relatives, the bushbuck and the nyala. That's the little family of these guys. Okay, so you see that impala now? Just listening to us, I think we're going to move off in a different direction. We've got to slowly start making our way back towards camp with the sun starting to head towards the horizon. So we'll do that, and I hear that Sydney has found something else.
I am looking for a uh, Kalamba. Kalamba got disappeared, and I can promise you now, Kalamba is at a distance of approximately 2,000 meters away from the mother. The mother's just left there, not even aware that Kalamba decided to move towards the the uh, western direct eastern direction of the reserve, and that gap is too much. When Talamba is threatened, I don't think Tandi will be able to defend her. So the little one now is just moving around by herself, trying to orientate herself, which is very much dangerous. So you can see uh, this cat just went past this uh, fire break. And if you can check by the fire break, it's not even camouflaged. It's nice and clear. So she can easily become a target. So here by the fire break, it looks very much dry. Uh, Linda. These animals, they, they can even do what is called cannibalism, where predators, they, they can be able to kill each other. Yes, chances are very high. Hyenas will definitely eat that baby leopard. And it's not stopping. God disappeared. It's just that the, 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 the cub, Kalamba decided to get disappeared by the prohibited area. I can't go there, unfortunately, but I saw where she went. Maybe she's going to come back again here, or the mother got to follow, Tandi, uh, Tandi got to follow Kalamba and see where she is. Obviously, when Tandi got up there, it's going to get very much... Uh, upset yeah isabella what you are saying is what i'm saying be careful kalamba so i just want to go backwards forwards and try and see if we can be able to spot this uh, uh, Kalamba here so let me just try to see maybe you're going to be able to spot Kalamba here but it's quite very far I can promise you the distance between Kalamba and the mother is too risky Yeah, let me just try and go further back so that my operator camera figures can be able to spot from his position as he is higher up than I am. Yeah, I'm just going to try by all means and spot Kalamba. Yeah, there's a very big termite mound which is obstructing the view. I can't see very well on the other side. Uh, Sal, I am very quite sure that Tandi is not aware about this uh, distance disappearance of Kalamba. How Kalamba left there, I saw it happening. I was on a sighting and Tandi is facing towards the southern side of the game reserve watching the hyena and Kalamba was at the back and Kalamba slowly left Tandi and created a gap. Earlier on, they were all together. Same thing happened, but the mother could be able to pick up this, the noise from the grasses when Kalamba was moving away. And then she just stood up and ran away in order to get hold of uh, Kalamba. But this time, 
Kalamba managed to ex escape without the mother knowing what she's doing and where she's going. And that might disturb Tandi a little bit when it comes to the mood. Soon as she, pick, she picks up the disappearance of Talamba, she's not going to be very happy. And she might not be happy with everybody now. Yeah, now while I'm still looking for Talamba here, there is a guided walk taking place in the park. Let's see what Ralph is having at the moment on the other side. Well, everyone, I'm still, still trying to find the bird that Craig has spotted for you, but uh, uh, he says it's a white-browed scrub robin. And, uh, well, they are very pretty little birds, and they do like hopping around in the scrub, as their name suggests. And they've got one of the most variable of all the little birds' calls. And, there's, you know, there's all sorts, and they... Let me try some of it. Um, they do a... <laughs> And they're very much of a songbird are all the robins. And that's obviously just one of their little things. And as I say, very variable. Um, and you also do get the bearded scrub robin and the brown scrub robin. Uh, so those three are very difficult to tell apart because they do sing very, very nice little tunes. And I'm not hearing him call at the moment. Um, but uh, very nice that we would have been able to spot one. It's lovely. Now, Barb, um, uh, birds do have a, a sense of smell. Um, they will be able to pick up different scents, and and um, and, and they also are able to feel um, with their bills. Uh, but uh, they, they've normally got little air uh, openings on top of their bills, um, so they can pick up different scents. Um, but uh, they definitely use a lot of their sight, um, especially the diurnal uh, birds, a very, very sharp eyesight. And it's all to do with the differences in rods and cones inside those, uh, those eyes. Um, but uh, much like the reptiles then, which they basically are reptiles with feathers, um, it does make for difficulties in judging depth. So they can see very far, but then struggle to, to work out that depth as to where things are. So that's why you often find birds, uh, especially the predatory birds, bobbing their heads and moving it from side to side. And in fact, in so doing, triangulating exactly where their target is. So at the moment, I'm just hearing all sorts of little scrub birds calling. And you very often hear the little alarm call that some of the birds do. And it can be across the board because it, 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 it uh, stimulates the other birds to come in and help them mob uh, a, a common enemy, and they sometimes do it like psh, 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 and if you do that, you can sometimes actually call them in if there's a bit of a bird party around. So we often just sit and do that, and there's one doing it at the moment. I'm wondering if he's spotted something like a snake or a predatory bird. There's a few birds just flitting around there and doing a little bit of an alarm call, but... Uh, Sometimes they can also mimic uh, that to get rid of um, uh, birds, like the chorister robin will do that. If there's a, a nice a food source, they then exhibit the sort of alarm call uh, to get rid of the birds uh, so that they can then uh, feed on, on the food all on their own. So birds can be quite tricky sometimes, and uh, mimicking like the forktail drongo also mimics uh, very often the pearl-spotted owlet. But... Uh, uh, because that one um, uh, attacks other birds and feeds on them. So, very nice. So, Lindsay, you say that that's your 200th species of birds on Safari Live. So, Lindsay, well done. Good stuff. 200 species, that's a good amount of birds. 
I'm not much of a bird counter myself, but I must say, 200 birds, that's um, definitely an accolade. So well done, Lindsay, um, and keep it up as, as we go along. But uh, you can see just in the area where we are at the moment, very, very brown, very dry looking. Everything is gray, brown, the grass is all lying over on itself, and the trees are all pretty much leafless at the moment, except for the odd quarry uh, or... Um, uh, bush willow uh, lying around a little bit with the odd termite mound and the soil poking through it does definitely make it out as if uh, things are pretty dead around here but it's definitely not now Paula after after there's a fire it would depend on when the next rains come. So when, like now, they've burnt uh, some of the fire breaks at the moment um, and the grass isn't going to come through just yet. It's going to come with the new uh, rains and that'll probably be around September period. And after that, it's literally within, uh, within a week you start to have the new grass coming through. But uh, if it was burnt in summer, obviously it wouldn't burn as badly because it, it would be green. So you generally burn it when it's dry. But it does happen sometimes and then that regrowth will be pretty quick and sharp um, after that. So it, it's all down to the real summer growth, uh, especially here in the low felt. Where I'm from in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, we have a lot more evergreen trees and a lot of greenness uh, that continues on through uh, the winter periods as well. Right, we're going to continue on our route heading back towards camp, but I hear the Tundi's still around. Tundi is still around, we're having quite a good time with her here. Uh, she's perched perfectly, perfectly here on the log, and I'm assuming that Sydney hasn't managed to find Tlalamba yet. We will move out of here so that he can come back and enjoy this cat. I think in a little while. In fact, maybe we won't. I don't know where he's gone. Anyway, we'll find out. I do feel it's a little unfair that I came in here, simply because my cat happened to be a flat cat. We will attempt, of course, to do a... Uh, we did attempt to do a little promotion. Uh, naturally, the script that I wrote took me about seven days to get through. Anyway, that's as it be that as it may. We're enjoying her posing perfectly in the light here. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, Paula, the light really is just quite stunning on her, isn't it? And she's so completely relaxed at the moment. It's magical. I promised this morning that I was going to stop using the word magical, but I have as yet failed. Uh, I suppose you'll forgive me given what we're looking at here. I can't believe how relaxed she is. I haven't seen her this relaxed around vehicles for a long time. And there's another chap in the sighting. He drove right up close and she didn't even blink an eyelid, which is fantastic. Yeah, she's fast asleep. It is so interesting also how Tlalamba is spending more and more time away from her. Of course, that's totally normal. As a leopard gets to around nine or ten months old, she is going to spend less and less time with mum. That's how they operate. And by a year, she could be independent. I mean, certainly if her brother has anything to go by, she'll have to be. Tandy, of course, getting on, as it were, and it'll be interesting to see if she does have another cub. No, Robin, I know there's nothing wrong with the word magical. There's quite a lot wrong, though, with using it incessantly like I have been. It's become a bit of a sort of verbal crutch, as it were. I, I keep using it again and again. And hopefully uh, I will find some other sort of adjective. Incredible is another one that uh, we all get stuck on from time to time, everything becomes incredible. I once counted the Incredibles in a TV show review that we did. We watched the thing over the course of two hours, and Incredible was used, what was it, 
It was it was a Hosanna and it was a Hosanna and a Shongile sighting. And incredible was used a total of sixty four times in the two hours by all of the presenters. So that was quite something. Right, well, I didn't want to spend too long with her, I suppose, if she's lying that close to them. Quick photograph or two, and go and have a gin and tonic. Perfect evening. <laughs> I don't know, child of the universe, it's possible. Um, you know, these things vary. There's so many variables we absolutely have no idea about. So she might become independent at 12 months. She might take 18 months to become independent. I don't know. Well, that's not a bad shot, is it, Senzel? How's the two shot there? Not good. Not working. OK, we're going to do another promo eventually depending on whether she moves or not. Well, Amy, the picture of the leopard is picture perfect, yes, but I'm going to have to move the car slightly for my next promo attempt. Um, Faith, do you mind if we quickly have a go before the sun sets? Marvellous. OK, let's go back across to Sydney. He's somewhere around here, look, I think, looking for Tlalahamba. Yeah, Tlalamba just got disappeared and uh, I am battling to get hold of uh, Tlalamba at this stage. However, I have got something very much interesting to talk to you about. If you can look there, you can see that there is some grass bent and the area has been bent not long time ago. And some other people are asking themselves, was it a natural fire or it was man-made? Fires, we do use them as part of the management tools in conservation. We use them to create fire breaks so that winter season, uh, towards spring, when the rain is charging, sometimes natural fires, as a result of lightning, they do okay. So this kind of fire breaks, they help. Apart from that, if there is any kind of accidental fire, so that it doesn't affect the whole part, we create this kind of fire breaks. So these grass, they look dead, but they are not dead. I am telling you, grasses are very much clever because their gross points, they hide them at the bottom. They are inaccessible. Even the grazers, it's not easy for these animals that eat grass to uh, be able to reach the growth point of a grass. Grass, instead of getting irritated by the fires, they enjoy it. So grasses knows that fires is burning plant old material and the new growth is going to come out. So this grass, all of them, none of them is died. Come the rainy season, you will see them regrowing again. And it's not going to be the new seeds coming out. Very same old grasses are all going to recover and bring too much nutrients for these animals to feed. We do need fires in this kind of a natural environment. Uh, Kathy, the reason to control the burn is that we don't want the fire to burn everything for the animals. If we don't control the burn, the grass are so dry at this stage, it's the dry season, Otherwise, all the grasses are going to be wiped away and animals are not going to have anything to eat. So that is why we have got to control the ban. Reason for us to, con to do these fire breaks is to try and be proactive. Look at that. Some of these birds, Foxtail Drongo, quite a lovely bird. He's looking for some kind of insects here by these bent areas. But it's still getting, because now insects are very exposed because the area is burned. So these are kind of birds which are getting benefit from these uh, fire breaks. Look at that. So that was a foxtail drongo.
Uh, Paula, I am not too sure about the species that are migrating the most here in Juma. I, since I have got here, I've got here just during the dry season after the birds have already migrated. So not too sure about the species of birds that are migrating the most or that are occurring in the area. The birds that I have met so far here in Juma, they are all common residents. I haven't met the migratory species yet. Only when they come back by the rainy season is when I'm going to familiarize myself with them. So that is uh, not even the foxtail drone, but that's a black fly catcher. See, the foxtail drone or the tail has got a fork, and that one does not have a fork, so I couldn't recognize it properly uh, during the first sighting. It's quick. Yes. So the name says it all a black fly catcher so it's catching the uh, the insects Shelly, uh, thank you for the comment. Yes, now the light is getting beautiful. The sun is now approaching the horizon. So I can see the reflection of the sun is now coming to this side. So I'm just going to reverse a little bit and show you how beautiful the sun is getting at the moment. Yeah, I'm just going to reverse a little bit, not too much. Yes, I'm going to show you a very beautiful sun. You can see now the sun is approaching the horizon. That is beautiful. Look at that. So you can see that in Africa, we've got a very beautiful sun set. But also our sun rises are very much beautiful. See, the sun is very much bright eh, just before it get disappears. So as soon as the sun goes down, Ivy, thank you. Yes, it is quite a pretty picture. Lovely. So now that picture is going to serve a purpose. Soon as that sun goes down, it will be a big call to the animals that are active during the night, the nocturnals to come out. As I'm talking to you now, the temperature is starting to get cooler and getting cooler. So when it's getting cooler like this, the animals that are active much more at night, they are now going to pick up that and it's when they are going to stretch and become active. And those that are active during the day, when the sun is going down, is also saying to them, go and rest. Yeah, you can uh, have me for uh, quite a couple of minutes just to enjoy the sun going down in Africa. Juma Game Reserve the western side of Kruger National Park. It is quite amazing to see the sun going down. A lot of people don't realize that. I am out in the bush every day and I'm so very much privileged to see the sun going down every day and to see the sun coming out almost every day. beautiful sunset and the clear skies. When the sun is going down, it goes down very much quickly. So you can see that the sun is going, is traveling, is rotating at a high speed. Because when it's going down, it's it just going to take very few seconds, it's gone. So the sun looks very much big, unbelievable 
to see that the sun is even 5 million younger than natural water. So the water was born first before the sun. The water is just about 5 million years older than the sun. So when this sun is going down like this, also some of the birds, they are going to start calling now. Birds, they've got a very interesting behavior. So now uh, the sun is about to go down. What I'm going to do now is to see if Ralph on foot has got something. Otherwise, it's going to be very dangerous for Ralph to walk at night. Well, everyone, as we're making our way back towards camp, uh, we stop for all these little interesting things. And this here be a gall. G-A-L-L, -L, and it's on a silver cluster leaf, and I'm sure that a lot of the regular viewers or any regular visitors to South Africa would have seen these before, but it is quite incredible that this is caused by an insect, um, and so this is not natural on the tree. Well, it has been caused naturally by another organism, uh, but not naturally occurring on the silver cluster leaf itself, or Terminalia cirrhosea, which is now pretty much without leaves. But this is actually from a wasp that has come and stung the, the tree. So they don't just sting animals or us as humans, they also sting plants. And what they then inject it with is a growth hormone. And it then creates a little uh, um, sort of cavity that the wasp can then go and nest in. And so very clever uh, from the wasp and I wonder how this evolution began um, and what will happen then is it, it lays its eggs on the inside and those little larvae will uh, metamorphosize and break their way out um, as we can see with that hole there once they uh, reach adulthood and they will emerge as wasps and very very interesting there's all sorts of different species of these as well and if you go back you can actually see that this tree is almost like a Christmas tree with decorations from the uh, gall wasps all over the place here all these little galls here uh, dotting and it's quite particular for the silver cluster leaf so I'm not quite sure what the exact reason for that is and if any of you do know why uh, the gall wasps attack uh, Terminalia cirrhosea uh, or the silver cluster leaf in particular, please send those answers to the hashtag on uh, uh, Safari Live on Twitter because I'd love to know. I, I do know that um, it's quite uh, sort of species specific like we do get with the fig trees and the fig wasps each different fig tree uh, has a different fig wasp that will go in to pollinate the different fruits um, but very very interesting now as it's starting to head towards darkness I don't know if you guys can hear but uh, it's quite a way off so I don't think you can but the hyenas are already waking up and we can hear them doing their characteristic whoop and I can hear them just up front here so I wonder, it's going to be an interesting evening when the hyenas start calling at that early stages of the night. I wonder if it's because um, Tingana and those guys have got um, meat still up the tree. Uh, but that's very interesting indeed. So I wonder if they're going to be bothering those leopards tonight. But, uh, well, speaking of leopards, off to James. Right, well, here we are, everybody. We are still with the magnificent Tandi. We got slightly closer to her actually this time. And because she seemed so relaxed, we did another little promo attempt, which her Senzor tells me was relatively acceptable. And he was quite fussy about it actually. I kept doing them and then just thinking they were okay and he'd say, no, the angle's not quite right. Please try and get out of the car. In the last one, he basically had me sitting on the log next to her, which was quite effective. <laughs> no sign of Tlalamba, and I'm assuming Sydney and Fergus didn't manage to find her. Anyway, she'll be around here somewhere.
Mum's looking very relaxed, isn't calling at all. And now the two of them apparently are heading towards the lions. That's fantastic. Good idea. Those lions could easily get up and start hunting, which will be fantastic. This is very beautiful indeed, Senzo. I have not heard you say that before, actually. Well, that is a pretty magic sight. I took a couple of illegal photographs as well, everybody, but now the light has gone, so the camera must go away. Shall we have a quick look at her and fleer? Fleer. 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 Are we on fleer? There we are. You will now see the fleer picture. She's got a warm nose, warm ears. And whether she has a warm heart or not, I don't know. If you are a new viewer, this particular piece of technology is made by Fleer, and it is a thermal image, basically. It's picking up the heat signature of the mammal. Uh, the mammal in question here is Tundi, and you can see precisely why she's lying on that log. Look how warm it is. Wood does retain the heat quite nicely after uh, it's been sunned, and obviously that wood has been sunned for a little while now and that's why she's very comfortably sleeping on it. The temperature will plummet sometime during the night. I again use the term plummet advisedly because clearly I realize that my definition of a plummeting temperature compared with the definition of a plummeting temperature if you come from Canada for example or Russia or Iceland for that matter yeah, is really very poor. I have no conception of that sort of level of cold. Nor does Senzo, I might say. Senzo, how many layers have we got on so far? Senzo is currently wearing five layers. The temperature is, I'm going to guess, when the wind blows, probably about 61 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 centigrade. Maybe even warmer than that. Have you got something else to wear as well? Oh, he's got five with him. How many are you wearing currently? Four. Just four. Senzo is from a place called Peter Maritzburg, which probably doesn't even get as cold as this. Take care, the eyeballs are hot because they're not insulated. That's why. So the rest of her body is insulated by hair and skin, which stops the heat escaping, but her eyeballs are absolutely not. I'll tell you what might be quite interesting. I um, <laughs> can't believe I'm going to offer you this opportunity. Um, I don't mean that to you, the viewer. I mean that to Senzo. Senzo, is that Fleer too zoomed in to focus on my bald head? I'd be fascinated to know if the top of my bald head gives off more heat than the rest of my body. Is it possible or not? It is possible. Okay, here we go, everybody. Here we can do an experiment. I'm going to turn this way because I want to see the experiment. Okay, let's put me in Fleer. Am I too close? Okay. All right, we'll do it when we've moved away from the leopard. I'll get off the car and we can show you. No, it's not going to... Oh, there it is. There's my face. Okay, now, here we go, everybody. You Look at that. My head looks like the sun. Okay, back to the leopard. <laughs> so there you are, everybody. You see bare skin and <laughs> bare skin <laughs> and insulated by hair. And it looks like the sun. You see, Senzo, did I look like a heavenly being there? I thought I did. I think we're going to do an experiment when it gets dark and we're going to put you in front of the car as well because you have a lot of hair and we'll see if your head is any less sun-like than mine. I look like Iron Man, that's right, that's right, yes. 
I can't fly, though. Maybe I can. I just haven't tried. The Tundi, very, very peaceful, of course. And why shouldn't she be at Sunday, after all? She's not at work. All right, let's see how far Sydney's got towards the lion prior that Ralph had earlier. Yeah, I have just left uh, Tandi and Kalamba in that area. Now I am heading towards the area where the lions has been spotted earlier. I just want to try and see if we can find those lions. So now my plan is the king of the jungle. So I haven't seen anything yet on the road, So, but I hope when I got there, I'm going to find those lions. I can't wait to get there and see if we can find them. That will be a big bonus after a good sighting of Kalamba and Tandi this afternoon. So now uh, we can go to uh, Ralph uh, while I'm heading towards the lion area. Well, everyone, we sort of, um, we're right here near to where camp is. We've now come to quarantine. And um, sorry, I just got uh, a little message in my ear there saying that we were off air, but we're not. We are live. And, um, well, we're here out in quarantine, and we're in that last little uh, time of, of light. The sun has now well set, and we're just watching as uh, quite unusually. And now I'm not going to be expecting Craig to follow, but once again, we've spotted some bats that are flying around. And I find this uh, very fascinating because um, they generally are not around uh, at this time of year. There's not enough food for them. Uh, generally and normally um, and so they, for me you know they normally migrate uh, to the eastern parts uh, near to the coast the forested areas where it's a lot warmer um, because of the ocean and then up into uh, maybe uh, central Africa and closer to the the equator but these little micro chiroptera uh, or the insect eating bats and we do call I know that they're quite common the little horseshoe faced bat uh, they actually look rather strange if you look at them at close up, but they're tiny little things and uh, they're flitting around all over the place. But really, they've just arrived in the last few days um, and I wonder what it's all about. So that's really strange. Now, Cenac, the bird that I haven't seen in these parts, but uh, I would love to see, is the Narina trogon. Um, but uh, you do uh, really struggle to find them uh, in these parts. And also more closer to uh, a little bit more forested areas. Um, where I am from in the Eastern Cape, there's quite a lot of them there, but they're such a beautiful bird. Um, another one being the gorgeous bush shrike, um, but also a little bit more tropical. Um, and that pennant winged nightjar, that is one that I always love seeing, but at the moment they won't be in breeding plumage, so you don't see those long streamers coming off the edge of their wings that uh, really make them special, and you'll see that in the summer months. And you can also call them uh, when they are around with those streamers, uh, with their very similar call to their uh, sort of territorial call. So, folks... Um, we're going to now slowly be uh, wandering back into camp. As per usual, once the light fades, it's not really safe for us to be out here because those lions that we were watching earlier, they're quite nervous of us during the day. But once it gets to this time of the day, uh, they turn into a completely different beast. And we don't want to be around when that happens. So we're out, folks, and we'll see you tomorrow. Yes, good night, Ralph. May you sleep well, Captain Pindrop. Here we have Tundi again. She's just decided to shifty a little, but that the warmth of the log makes me want to go over there and lie on it, I must say. I don't think I probably will. I think it would be suicidal, but uh, I would like to. I think it's just getting slightly uncomfortable now. She might go for a move. She might start calling 
her daughter. Monique, uh, um, very good question. Why doesn't the thermal pick up warm breath? I guess there's probably just not enough of it. I suspect that if she started to breathe very heavily, then you might see streaks of warmth coming out of her mouth, but yeah, I'm, I couldn't really tell you. I just imagine that the density of what she's exhaling is probably not sufficient to actually create a heat signature for the sophistication of camera that we have, or the camera of the level of sophistication that we have. Oh, dear Queen. Look how pretty you are. Well, I would quite like that too. Michelle, I'd love to see Tlalamba coming to Mummy so that you can rest in peace. Well, she's around. She's very independent. She doesn't like to hang around Mum too much. She's just hitting that teenage phase when it's not that cool to be around Mum all the time. But she's not quite independent enough not to depend on Mum's food and the safety she provides. I certainly would not be too afraid if Tundi was my mother. She is not a cat to be trifled with. She's just listening to some alarm calls of some Franklins. See how she's looked towards them exactly like we might. She's obviously better at assessing whether they are a potential threat than we are. That's the direction that the hy hyena went off in. So maybe the Frangolinos are shouting at the Franklin, at the hyena. Gracious, one too many mornings of waking up at three o'clock. That's so that you all feel sorry for me, everybody. That's why I said that. Betty, you're looking at her there, just like uh, Queen Elizabeth is just about the oldest person in Britain, so Tandy is the oldest leopard on Juma. Oh, no, she's not. I'm talking rubbish. Sorry. Tingana's older than her. Tingana's, we think. We don't actually know when Tingana's birthday is. But he is probably about a year older than she is. Well, yeah, maybe. They're roughly the same age. He was in theory. No, you know what? I don't think that's. We think he was born beginning of 2006. So he actually would have. You know, he'll be somewhere between 12 and 13. Now she's potentially going to live much longer than he has, because she's a female, and the females do tend to live two or three years younger than the ma longer than the males. Alrighty, now let's just see what she does. I'm not going to move yet. This, of course, is the tree that she had her little kill in earlier this evening, this evening, this morning. We found her here at what time? About quarter past four. We came up here, and here she was. She's looking up into the tree. I don't see anything left there. Unless she's hung just the head there. I'm going to move slightly and then we'll get a better view if she does get up the tree. Do you hear that? Wendy just started. Boom! Straight off. Can't believe she's going to go up the tree, you know. There is a bit of Steenbock left. Up she goes. Oh, sorry about that, Sinzel. This car is in a state of severe distress. going to get a lovely sighting now. We'll just pop around the side here, see what we can see from there. And then what we are going to do is, as it gets dark, is we're going to move out of the sighting so that if Tlalamba does come back, we're not here in the darkness. We don't want to be here in the darkness. The leopards, while when they're adult, it does make much of a difference. 
Uh, it's just not great when there is meat to be here, when there are there are youngsters around. There's a big log in my way, excuse me. not the best view, is it, Sinzel? I mean, that's her bottom, really. Um, let's try this, see if she turns around. If she doesn't turn around, everybody, I will go back the other side. Shall we go into infrared, uh, Faith? Would you like us in infrared? Oh, beautiful. Well done, Hinzel. Fantastic. Yes, I think that I've parked you all, and I apologise, in the worst possible position. The horizon is still too bright for us to get any contrast on the cat. That is her back end. I mean, while it's a relatively attractive back end, it is not a most attractive part. So as we move from here and try and get a better picture, let's go to Sydney and see how his lion expedition is going. I have already started doing my trekking and I have been lucky so far. I did manage to pick up a very fresh lion track. You can see on the ground there so the chances of uh, seeing the lions are very much high tonight so now without any waste of time i am going to follow the tracks before it gets very dark <laughs> yeah they are very much fresh tracks so then I'm convinced that we might find them. Uh, I didn't get the name of the viewer, but what I can tell you is that crickets at this stage, they are not available. They are hiding. They will come back during the summer season. It's very much quiet at the moment. Very, very much quiet. So the tracks I saw are heading. The tracks uh, I, I have seen, they are heading towards this direction. So I just want to try and go around here and see if we can find something. Uh, the dung beetles are one of the very most interesting insects and then the dung beetles they help us a lot without having the dung beetles South Africa as a country which is a country where I come from was going to experience a very serious problem when it comes to the population of flies when the dung beetles are destroying the droppings creating balls is when they are destroying a place for the flies to lay more eggs. In other words, they help to, mimina, to minimize the population of flies. And after that, the dung beetles, they, they uh, roll the ball and dig the ground in order to bury the ball. Digging the hole increases the space within the soil for water penetration. And after that, they are going to bury the ball under the ground. Now they are going to act as a natural fertilizer. So you can see that that insect is very small in size, but has got a quite significant role in order to prepare the soil for the seed germination. So now I'm just going to try to radio in and hear if there is anything happening by the lions, because I can see now lions in front here, they are walking, some are coming towards my direction. We have managed to win the battle. Here comes the... It's quite a number of uh, lions. I'm not too sure how many.
This is lovely. Look at that. Look at the tip of the tail. Nice and black. Look at the, the color behind the ears. The tips, nice and black. Considerating, listening to what is happening in the area. Michelle, wow. Yes, this is a very much magnificent sighting. Look at that. So lions are my favorite cats. Uh, Waveland, yes, true indeed. Lions are amazing. Look at that. How they are walking. They are walking as if they don't like. Look at the muzzles. You can see that those muzzles has been designed for hunting purposes. So, so now I'm just gonna move forward a little bit and see if we can have a good, good sighting. So now uh, we can we can go to a James and see what Tani is doing on the other side while I'm trying to find a better visual. We've got two absolutely gorgeous pictures here. I'm not sure which one you're on. I'm assuming you're on the infrared one. I love the contrast of that black and white picture. It really, I don't know, it does something profound for me. So we'll zoom in on the cat. And as we do that, we'll merge into the sort of, well, pink figure of Tandy eating her Stienbork. It's almost disturbing watching the crunching and those, those golden uh, oh, eyes looking at us. Hello. <laughs> also, you can see the warmth on the Stienbork, not because it's making heat of its own, because obviously it's long dead but because of the saliva of the predator chewing on the meat. Somehow slightly less disturbing watching it in fleer than it is in glorious technicolor watching the poor antelope be chewed into very small fragments. Like I say, we're not going to stay here for long. This will be our last segment with Tandy. But it's just such a precious picture, this. Mm. I know there's something about this particular camera that we're using that does a glorious job of creating a black and white picture with the infrared. We use two kinds of cameras, and I think this one does a better job at this particular thing. It's utterly hopeless in many other things, but it does a really good job with this one. Not much left of that Stienbock. I seriously doubt they'll be here tomorrow morning. It's not impossible that they would be just sort of resting up here. I always think it must be so nice to be a leopard with a kill because the relief of having something to eat for four days, of not having to go off and struggle and try and find some food, especially if you're a mother like this one, it must be so nice to have a pantry in the tree that you know no hyena can get at. And obviously these wild 
animals don't think like that, I don't think. I'm sure she doesn't necessarily feel a sense of relief, but she certainly looked relieved and relaxed as she lay on that log. Now this crunching sound is going to attract the sharper eared animals out here, which is basically everything. So it could easily attract hyenas, and it may well attract Tlalamba back to the tree. She will be hungry, probably. But as I was saying this morning, she most certainly is still, or is, is giving kills, is giving kills. Um, <laughs> brain really is an uh, adult. She's making kills of her own. Small ones, I'm sure. Gerbils, scrub hairs, maybe. Birds, mongusta. Nice piece of meat there. It's not quite making me hungry, though, I must say. Then does this make you hungry, or do you just feel slightly nauseated by it? You don't have? You're not feeling hungry. Is that because you ate a box of eat some more biscuits before we left? Oh no, you didn't. You, let me tell you what. I, when I got on the car today, everybody, Senzo had a plate in his hand. We were on the car going to work, sort of kitchen. And in the plate was the following. <laughs> Senzo, what was in the plate? It was bread and raisin bread and ice cream and what else? And yogurt. And yogurt. Raisin bread, ice cream and yogurt is what Senzo had for, for lunch today. It's no wonder he's not hungry when you watch his Tandy eating. All right, everyone, we're going to leave this kitty because we want to give an opportunity for Tlalamba to come back if she can. In the meantime, Sydney, I believe, has another view of the Nkuhuma Prai. Yeah, I've got um, the Unkuhuma pride here. They are all walking uh, on the road. It's quite a number of them. You can see the, they are slowly walking down. Some of them are in the bushes. So it's quite a lovely sighting. You can see now they are becoming active. The time is suitable for them to walk around now. So now we, we are going to go um, onto the infrared. You can see now they are nice and, uh, and clear there. This is quite a big pride. I love lions. Look at them. Uh, how they walk is interesting. It's like they're bored. It's like they're bored. A Debra, the Nkuhuma pride is a lovely pride. Look at that. All on the road. They're just everywhere. This is lovely. So I'm just going to try and move forward a little bit and see if I can have a better visual again. <clears throat> so they're not walking very fast. They are all walking very slow. They are very much relaxed. So I'm not going to lose this sighting. Uh, 
trustee, I'm going to uh, count them now for you. I will tell you just now. Just give me a little bit of minutes. I will tell you how many I'm seeing. But it's quite a lot at the moment. Uh, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, if I'm seeing nicely, I think they are 11 or 12. They are 11 or 12 together. This is beautiful. So they are not showing any in intention. All they are doing is just walking. Uh, See so now, I have experienced lion hunt on several occasions, and recently, a few days ago, here in Juma, I saw the Talamati, the Talamati pride nearly caught a buffalo in front of me. They are very much interesting when hunting lions. Look at that on a convoy. This is beautiful. So this is quite a lovely sighting. Look at this, just everywhere on the road. All you see is just lions, lions everywhere. This is exciting. <laughs> this is very beautiful, eh? <laughs> this is very much interesting. You can see one coming to join from the side. Uh, Ali, I didn't get the question very nicely. If uh, FC, you can uh, um, give me that question again. Uh, I am not too sure. Um, uh, Ali, she, she, she's I am not sure if uh, she's here, but she is part of this pride. So I'm still battling a little bit with the recognition of some of the individual amongst these prides and different um, coalitions in the reserve. So now I'm just going to move on and see them nice and closer again. <laughs> yeah, that's a lovely comment, uh, Giraffe Girl. Unkuhuma traffic jam. You can see the the traffic is not moving because of them. <laughs> uh, they are so lovely. <laughs> yeah, different viewers has got different views on this uh, uh, pride. Uh, Paula is saying the lions are like a flowing river of lions. That is that is what I'm seeing. Eh?
I am still here enjoying the last moment of the pride going down on the road. They're just everywhere. It's quite a lovely animal. Now they are relaxing. Some of them are lying on the road. One is lying on the road looking at the others going down. Look at that. So today has been a very great afternoon. Quite a lot of cats activities. It was lovely. Punctuated with a, a beautiful sunset. Leopards and lion during the same drive. Thank you very, very much for all your comments and all your questions. We will meet again tomorrow at half past six.